During the Second World War, the US Army Air Force flew thousands of sorties over occupied Europe as part of the Allied strategic bombing campaign. They flew these in two different aircraft, the Boeing B-17 Flying Fortress and the consolidated B-24 Liberator. The B-17 and B-24 were both four-engined heavy bombers with around the same speed, range, bomb load and defensive armament. By the end of the war, nearly 13,000 B-17s and 18,000 B-24s had rolled off their production lines back in the States and, along with British bomber aircraft, flew 1.44 million sorties over Europe. But the numbers were strange. Post-war reports suggest that one of these bombers was significantly more effective than the other. In fact, one aircraft performed more than 80% better. So how is that possible? What was it about the B-17s or B-24s design that led to that absolutely shocking statistic? And 80% better at what exactly? Join me as we settle once and for all which was the superior bomber, the B-17 or the B-24. It might be helpful to understand why the Air Force had two heavy bombers in the first place. The B-17 had entered service in 1938, supplanting the obsolete B-18 Bolo. And it was a good design. Relatively large bomb load, ample range, fast and bristling with machine guns. A flying fortress, if you will. But military aviation development was moving at a breakneck pace, as is evident looking at the unfortunate B-18, and the US weren't about to rest on their laurels. They also had another company, Consolidated Aircraft, that believed they had a design that could outperform the B-17. Consolidated were famous for their recent successes in the flying boat market, with the Catalina and the Coronado leading the pack. They had high-mounted wings, allowing a bulbous, buoyant fuselage to keep the aircraft afloat in the water. But what if, for example, you put a big door on the bottom of that big, boxy fuselage? And what if you filled it with bombs? Consolidated were confident that they could use their experience making large, four-engined aircraft to make a modern, successful bomber design. They also had a trick up their sleeve, David R. Davis. Davis had been playing around with an idea for a new wing, one that he thought would revolutionise aircraft design. Davis was trying to construct a wing that produces lots of lift, but with minimal drag, so like everyone else. Apparently he designed his wing backwards, starting with the ideal low drag shape of a teardrop and manipulating it to produce lift. And this is what his patent looked like, it's, it's really clear and, and simple. Basically, he was trying to construct an airfoil that would allow air pressure to drop very gradually over the top of the wing, lowering profile drag and increasing efficiency, even at high angles of attack. This meant that the middle of the wing had to be quite thick to facilitate this and the cord quite short. A thick wing allowed two big spars to be put through it. This meant the wing could be a lot longer, further reducing drag. You could also fill this big, thick wing with fuel. You'd be going faster and more efficiently with the Davis wing. It's no surprise then that the Air Corps and Consolidated were excited about the Model 32, this new bomber with its impressive modern wing. Adopted as the B-24, the new bomber compared well to the B-17. It flew faster, climbed faster and had a longer maximum range, but its smaller wing area meant it flew around 5,000 feet lower. Okay, you're not stupid, and I'm sure you can see where all this is going, so I'll we'll just get into it. Despite these advantages, the B-24 was, according to US reports, the inferior bomber in Europe, by far. The calculation they used to conclude that the B-24 was 80% worse than the B-17 was this one. Efficiency of bomber operation is measured by the destruction of the target, i.e. accurate bomb hits, divided by the cost of the operation i.e. aircraft and crews lost. So clearly, the B-24 was either inaccurate and landed less bomb hits, or more were lost per mission. Well, it was both. But before we get into that, a short word from today's sponsor, Raycon. As Valentine's Day approaches, I'm inviting you guys to discover True Love's perfect pair, Raycon's everyday earbuds. These earbuds are the ideal partner, for the gym, your work, going for a run, or taking phone calls on the go. 
offering premium audio at an accessible price point. This is now my sixth month of using everyday earbuds and have not disappointed me. With 32 hours of battery life, multi-point connectivity, quick charging and active noise cancelling. I've been trying to stay active over winter and it's been great to be able to take my music with me, even if it's just divorced dad rock, with the five different sizes of tips making sure that they stay in my ears and fit comfortably and the lovely looking protective case cover helping to keep them safe. They were already an incredible deal, but go to buyraycon.com forward slash RWF today to get up to 20% off site wide and help support the channel. You'll be annoyed you didn't get a pair sooner and if you don't love them for whatever reason, there's a 30 day happiness guarantee. Cheers. Okay, let's tackle bomb accuracy first. The US Air Force in Europe had two air forces, the 8th based in Britain and the 15th based in Italy. Both flew B-17s and B-24s, with each skewing towards one aircraft type. They flew different missions, used different tactics, and reported all of their statistics separately. Anyway, over the course of 1944, the 8th Air Force reported that 40.77% of bombs dropped from their B-17s hit within 1,000 feet of their target. That's about 300 meters, a big area. Over the same period, the B-24s only managed to get 37.8% of their bombs within that circle. The 15th Air Force saw similar results, with B-17s hitting 32.4% of bombs and B-24s hitting 304 This doesn't seem like a big difference. However, the B-17s were flying higher in larger combat boxes as part of larger forces. All three of these are factors which would significantly reduce accuracy so the fact they still came out ahead of the B-24 was telling. So why was accuracy poor? Well, considering they were using the same bomb site and the same bombs, it came down to the crew. The B-24 was notoriously difficult to fly. To better deal with Luftwaffe fighters and flak, the aircraft had been up-armed and up-armoured, hampering its stability and handling. It lacked the big, tall tail fin of the B-17, something that would be changed for some later models, and was known to just be a tricky aircraft to fly. The pilot had to constantly make adjustments and tweaks to keep the aircraft straight and level, making it harder to fly in tight formations and increasing pilot fatigue. I'm no scientist, but I imagine wobbly aircraft requiring constant attention don't bomb quite as accurately as something that essentially flies itself. But even if the pilot managed to keep the up-armoured, bomb-laden B-24 perfectly still, his bombardier could still mess things up. See, the 8th Air Force liked to salvo-release their bombs. It meant that they were dropped in a big, long string, meaning you were more likely to hit with at least some of them. However, the salvo-release lever in a B-24 is significantly harder to reach than a B-17, which means that the guy in the B-24 was more likely not to use it, dropping all of his bombs more or less simultaneously. That was great if you were exactly on target, but completely unforgiving if you were off target for any reason. Okay, so maybe that was why the B-24's accuracy was worse, difficult to control and annoying to salvo release. But accuracy wasn't the real killer in this equation. It was flak, enemy fighters and crashes. For every 100 sorties, 1.32 B-17s never made it back to base. For the B-24, this figure jumps massively to 1.7 a nearly 30% higher loss rate. Okay, why? Well, there are a few factors. Firstly, the B-24 flew lower. This meant it was far easier for enemy fighters to meet them and for flak to hit them. They also flew in slightly wider formations to accommodate for the difficult flying characteristics and the poorer pilot visibility, hampering their defensive armament and allowing them to be picked off one by one. But it doesn't stop there. The B-24's wing design was incredibly bad at standing up to punishment. The wing already experienced far higher loading than the wing of a B-17, and if incoming cannon fire or flak shells took a chunk out of it, weakening either of the two big supports in any way, the entire wing was likely to snap off or fold in on itself under the increased stress, dooming the aircraft and the crew inside. Even if the aircraft took some wing damage and it didn't completely fail, the landing gear were right at the wing route. This meant that landing with a damaged wing almost certainly led to it failing at a critical point, riding off the aircraft and, 
again, endangering the crew. It also had a nasty habit of the nose wheel collapsing, which wasn't even wing related. This, and the fact it was difficult to handle at low speeds and fatigued its pilots, led to a higher accident rate even for undamaged aircraft. 0.3 accidents for every 100 takeoffs, compared to 0.22 for the B-17. It was also a nightmare during water landings, despite consolidated specialty for flying boats. The thing about flying boats is that they don't have two massive, fragile doors right on the bottom of the aircraft. During water landings, the bomber would crash down straight onto its bomb bay, breaking the B-24 apart. The B-17 had wide, low wings that would help to absorb the landing. The B-24 had the opposite. As a result, you had a 38% chance of surviving a water landing in a B-17, but only 26.5% in a B-24. Grim. Both the British and Americans, who really liked to use the B-24 over water thanks to its excellent range, tried to reinforce the bomb bay to mitigate this somewhat, but it's unclear how much that actually helped, especially as it is yet more weight. I should point out here that my range comparison earlier was sneakily for unarmed aircraft. Fully laden, the B-17 had superior range to the B-24. I'm not sure about you, but I've seen quite enough. Let's see the final scores. For the 8th, the B-17 dropped 147.2 tons of bombs for each bomber lost. The B-24 dropped 149 tons? Was this entire video a lie? No, no. See, the 8th often operated their B-17s and B-24s separately, meaning they could choose which bomber went where. This meant they chose the largely superior B-17 to attack all the high-value, well-defended targets. They had more of them, and perhaps didn't enjoy watching their bombers' wings falling off. Anyway, the 15th operated their bombers on the same missions, so the data is more comparable. The B-17 dropped 192.6 tons of bombs for each loss. The B-24 only managed to drop 106.5 tons a staggering 80.8% decrease in efficiency. Over Europe, it was clear that the B-17 was the far superior aircraft. However, I want to stress this does not mean the B-24 was bad. Okay, so you are losing more bombers. What if you're also making more? The Willow Run plant managed to churn out a B-24 every hour for years, and the Liberator is the most produced bomber aircraft of all time. It also did have impressive range when not saddled with 5,000 pounds of bombs and extra armour, allowing it to have significant impact in the Battle of the Atlantic against the U-boat threat, and seeing massive success in the Pacific Theatre, where it was the preferred four-engine platform until the introduction of the B-29, which notably also used a high-aspect Davis-esque wing. Just shows you how lucky the US was to have two extremely capable bomber designs from the get-go, as well as incredibly brave crews to fly them. Hope you enjoyed this video, folks. It's a bit of a hybrid between my recent tank gun comparisons and the dogfight videos. Do let me know what you thought in the comments below. I want to give a lot of credit to these videos by the channel World War II US Bombers. Excellent, detailed assessments on many US aircraft and his research on the B-17 and B-24 was a phenomenal help in making this video. Link down below. Thank you again to my lovely patrons for supporting the channel and thank you for watching. Here's to 2025. I'll see you next time.